Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Aki Fujimara, who's the CEO of D2S, the managing partner of the eBeam initiative. And today that we're going to talk about Moore's Law and what's coming in the future and some of the problems ahead. What's going on with Moore's Law? What, what's new now that we didn't know going back three generations ago? Yeah, I think um, it's amazing that uh, we're still going at it with 193i. Um, it's um, uh, it's a testament to the entire community and the creativity that people have. Um, Moore's Law continues to uh, be in play and I think will continue to be in play for quite a while. Um, many of our uh, eBeam initiative advisors tell us from a, a fabulous point of view that what they see is that performance per watt aspect of Moore's Law continues to be good, but the economic benefits of Moore's Law are declining and uh, that's an issue. Uh, I think uh, some of the economic issues are coming from the lack of scaling, uh, the density scaling. The um, transistor gates are going down as scheduled, but uh, the, the functionality that you can fit on a chip are no longer scaling by a factor of two, and that's part of the, uh, what's contributing to the economic problems, I think. So what's the next step? Is it fixing the design? Is it coming up with new lithography? Is it multi-multi-patterning? Or where do we go next? I think all of the above. Um, there are a design side, like restricted design technologies to try to make it easier uh, to do lithography. There are many, many lithography, uh, uh, or not tricks, inventions really, uh, that are going on. A uh, lot of activity in DSA, a lot of activity in nano imprint, a uh, lot of activity, of course, in EUV, um, and uh, continuing activity in 193i with multiple patterning, complex shapes, and IoT, uh, inverse lithography technologies, and you know many things are going on in the community to uh, uh, try to be the next generation and uh, ability to do the. Uh, to continue along the Moore's Law. But I think what's happening uniformly in, uh, in the 193i domain is that you just can't help that it's becoming more and more difficult. And you know, more and more tricks are being overlaid on top of each other. And this is causing a wider variation of uh, possible outcomes. And being able to do um, narrow features once or narrow features most of the time may be good, but narrow features all the time consistently becoming much more difficult. So there's a distinction that you've drawn in the past between device scaling and design scaling. What exactly is that? So when devices scale, of course you expect the design to scale with it, but there's a little thing called how much space you have to have between the device and the next thing, or how much space you have to have in how you connect the devices together in a, in a connect above or in, in between or whatever. So um, device scaling is continuing to happen. Design scaling, not so much. You've drawn this out for us. Why don't you explain what's going on there? Yeah, so I like to do a little analogy here. So um, look at the top picture first. These are supposed to be cars. Um, so this is a car with the tires and so on. Um, first, we have a three-lane highway, right? You have three cars that can be next to each other. And each of the cars are, have a certain width that represents uh, the device uh, scaling, right? Um, but they also have wiggle room that they need so that when they're driving along and the car is not as perfect or the driver is not as perfect or whatever, um, and they can still have wiggle room. And you know, even if it's raining outside, you need to be able to have enough wiggle room, right? So um, the lanes here represent the design rules. The car width kind of represents the transistor gate length, maybe. And the wiggle room is how much you need to be able to account for manufacturing variation. Now, when you go from one node to the next, it used to be that you go from this generation to this, this generation, and this is kind of an analogy, so it's scaling by a factor of two, six cars instead of three um, in one dimension, but in semiconductors we know that, that it scales by 1.4 times in each dimension, right? But, you know, it's an analogy. And uh, uh, you have uh, six cars, each with half the 
gate length and have the wiggle room. So the number of cars that can fit in the same space is twice as much. This is how it used to be. Now, in the new era these days, it's not scaling like that anymore. The gate length might be scaling by a factor of two, but the wiggle room is not. So in order for the cars to not bump into each other, they have to be spaced apart further, even though the cars themselves are half as much, the space in between have to be larger. So if you were to draw a highway with the design rules of these lanes, you would need nine lanes, you can't fit 12 lanes anymore, and so on. Now, worse than that is this effect that some cars are bad drivers, and or bad cars, and um, you know, they might be red cars or something, and they need more wiggle room. So in order to keep that car safe, you have to maybe think about making a red lane that's twice as wide so that the red car can fit safely and not bump into anybody else. But that red car needs to go to the left side or the middle or whatever. You don't know where it's going to go. Well, you can't just have every lane be the red lane because then you can only fit like the old days when you had uh, three lanes, right? So, um, so you suffer from one bad car or occasional bad drivers when you have a rules-based approach, like you define lanes based on the worst driver or the worst car. The other side happens too. Some drivers and some cars are much better than others, right? Some cars are not average, like NASCAR drivers or New York City you know, taxi cab drivers, right? So they can drive much, much closer to each other and they're perfectly safe. So there are some cars that can actually be closer than the average, some cars that have to be farther than average, you need to have something that dynamically can adjust for that. So in this analogy, if you went to a um, uh, self-driving cars, but self-driving cars that's also aware and communicates with the next car over and the next car over to after that and so on. So if they're all coordinating, that's, um, that's analogous to doing simulation-based processing as opposed to design rule-based processing. Where design rule-based processing, you will be subject to the worst one to account for that. You have to make the, make the average very bad. You have to make the rules very bad. Or you have to make very, very complex, complex rules. If you have simulation-based processing that's dynamically adjusting to every situation, every neighbor, then you have a much, much higher density of cars that can fit in the same highway. And you can fit twice, three times, maybe even 10 times as many cars can go through without causing congestion. So working with your imagery here of a highway and shrinking down the lanes and the size of the cars, if you have things like process variation, you have uh, multi-patterning, the process variation becomes basically debris in the road that you have to swerve and, and watch out for, and your process variation becomes uh, maybe your car doesn't quite have four tires on it, maybe it has three, and maybe it's not quite put together as well as you had hoped, right? Yeah, so th that's a good example of a bad car, right? You know, you don't know which ones are going to be bad. That's the whole point. Right? It's all statistical, so you don't know beforehand that this one's going to be bad. So since you don't know, you have to make all of them okay. Right? Even though majority of them are perfectly fine with a, a narrower lane, be just because one car may happen to have a flat tire in essence, right? Um, so you, you, it's driving with three, you have to make everything wide. And the, the, the likelihood of a car with one flat tire is increasing as we get more and more complex into Moore's Law. What happens when we start going into, let me ask you this and see if you want to go there. What happens when we start going into 2.5D and 3D? Does it change any of this? Do we now say only some of this has to be done at the most uh, advanced nodes and maybe we don't have to do triple, quadruple, octuple patterning on every single uh, metal layer? Well, I think um, 3D is definitely a trend, no question about that, trying to get more density benefits without doing it only in a 2D plane. Um, in terms of what 
technology, what 2D technology is used when 3D is there. And I think that depends on what is pr prominent at the time. You know, whatever is the predominant technology that is then at the time uh, economically feasible, whatever it is, what they have is the cheapest, right? <laughs> Doing something new is going to be more expensive. So I think that's going to be just a question of timing when the intersection happens and so on. How far do you see Moore's Law extending? What's, what's the current uh, estimate in terms of how far it can go? Well, what I hear from other people, some people say, you know, it can keep going, seven, five, no question about it, three, uh, it, that, 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 you know, that's what I hear. But um, what I find in, you know, being in this industry for a while, and people say that about uh, three generations ahead all the time, and it still keeps happening. It's just, uh, it, it's amazing the human ingenuity and uh, the, the power of uh, you know desire to make something happen and uh, a group of people trying to you know uh, make a living on it you know they their lives depend on it and they come up with solutions. Can we get there though with 193 nanometer uh, wavelength on um, lithography or do we have to change everything fundamentally? Uh, going down technically is not an issue. Going down to those nodes with um, economic feasibility that is a question and um, I think it's going to require even more innovation. It's almost like you know th there's been difficulties in multiple different dimensions technically and another dimension has been added which is economic feasibility and people have been taking that uh, very very seriously for the last you know maybe seven seven eight years I guess you know and I think it's starting to take take shape and uh, I think in particular chemical uh, you know, chemistry-related uh, uh, inventions uh, like DSA. If you look at nanoimprint, that's also a cost-oriented solution. Um, I, I think many people are uh, at the uh, at the first class of innovation. Thinking about uh, being cheap is extremely important. So I think it, it's going to um, start seeing the fruits of the labor. Aki Fujimara, thanks for a great explanation. Yeah, thank you.